Now let's talk about predictive values. So in the last video we talked about sensitivity and specificity, which is good if you want to compare two tests. So let's say we got two blood tests. We got this blue one here and we got a green one here. And we decide which test do we want to use. And the particular situation we think of is we want to pick a test that will tell us with a good degree of certainty that a patient does not have a disease. Which one would you pick? You'd pick this one here with the greater sensitivity. Remember, we we're trying to rule out a disease, and a test with good sensitivity when it's negative helps you rule out a test, uh, rule out a disease. Or we could be looking for a test that helps us rule in a disease. Which one would be better between these two tests to help us rule it in? And it would be this test over here, because remember, a test with high specificity when it's positive helps us rule in a disease. But in clinical practice, we're usually not comparing two different tests. We instead have a patient in front of us in whom we don't know whether they have the disease or not. And we have a test for which we do know the result. We get it from the lab. And so from this, we have to make inferences about whether the patient does or don't have the disease. So how likely does a positive test mean that the patient has a disease or does a negative test mean that the patient is okay? So you'll remember our familiar two by two table that we talked about when we were looking at sensitivity and specificity, where we at the top we had whether a patient did or did not have the disease. So this is their disease state. And here was the state of the test, whether the test was positive or the test was negative. And if we filled in the table, we had our correct values here. This is a true positive and a true negative, meaning the test was negative when the patient didn't have a disease, or the test was positive when the patient did have the disease. And the times the test was wrong are written here in pink. So the test was negative when it should have been positive, so it's a false negative. And here, the test is positive when it should have been negative, so we have a false positive. So when we looked at sensitivity and specificity, we were looking at this. In all patients who have disease, how often was the test right? Or, and that was sensitivity. In all patients who have the disease, how often was the test right? So we went down in this column like this. And for specificity, we said in all patients who didn't have the disease, how often was the test right? And so we calculated that by looking down this column. But as I just mentioned, we don't know whether the patient has a disease or doesn't have the disease. What we do know is whether the test is positive or negative. So we can approach this table a different way. We could approach it this way. Here we're saying, in all times that the test was positive, how often was it right? And we call that the positive predictive value. And similarly, we could say, in all times that the test was negative, how often was it right? And we call this the negative predictive value. So you can see now we're calculating horizontally across the table, whereas when we were doing sensitivity and specificity, we were going vertically. Now these calculations are very similar to the ones that we did for sensitivity and specificity, except we're going to go across the table like this. So we're going to say, let's do positive predictive value first. Um, how many times was the test right, so true positives, over all the times that the test was positive. And similarly, for the negative predictive value, we want to do something very similar. And we're going to say, how many times was the test right? So that's true negatives. And we're going to put that over all of the times that the test was negative. So that's your true negatives plus your false negatives. So let's say you have a positive predictive value of 80%. What does that mean? Well, if you're holding a test which is positive, 80% of the time is going to be correct. So 80% of the time, that patient is going to have the disease. So let's say you actually have a negative predictive value that is 75%. What does that mean? That if you're holding a test which is negative, then three-quarters of the time, that test is going to be right. Three-quarters of the time, the patient is not going to have the disease. Now, there are some very important limitations of predictive values, and they have to do with the prevalence of disease. So let's take a look at that. Now, let's say we have here a sample of 40 people, and I drew here our familiar 2 by 2 table. Now, let's say that we have a test 
and it has a sensitivity and a specificity of 90%. And let's say of these 40 people here, half of them have the disease and half of them don't. And since there are 40, patient, 40 people here, that means 20 of them do have the disease and 20 of them don't. And so we know the sensitivity and specificity, so we can actually fill in these numbers here. We know that 9 out of 10, or 90% of patients with the disease, will have a positive test. So that's 18 over, over here, 18 out of 20 is 9 out of 10, and 2 will be wrong. And here, we know that 9 out of 10 of the patients who don't have the disease will have a negative test. So 18 here and 2 here. Now we can calculate our uh, positive predictive value and our negative predictive value. But before we do, let me just show you how I depicted this here. So we know that 18 of the patients who had the disease, so 18 of the people with the red dots in their heads, are going to have a positive test, which means a blue circle around them. And two of them who have the disease are going to have negative tests. So that's this guy here and this guy here. And now for the patients who don't have the disease, 18 of them are going to have negative tests. So that's that guy, that guy, that guy, all these guys who don't have their red dots on their heads and uh, don't have a circle on them. But we know that two of the patients who don't have the disease are incorrectly going to have a positive test. And so there's one right here and there's another one right here. Now let's calculate the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So now, instead of splitting the patients uh, into two groups based on who has a disease or not, we're going to split them into two groups based on all of those who have a positive test and all of those who have a negative test. So now what percentage of these with a positive test actually has the disease? That is, how many times is a positive test value going to be right? And we can count here. That's 18 times the positive test value is right out of 20 total. So 90% of the time. And here, down here, we can ask the same question. How many times is a negative test correct? It's correct for almost all of them except for this one and this one. So 18 out of 20 times, or 90%. But these numbers here, they are highly dependent on the prevalence of disease, meaning how many people actually have the disease. This over here. So what if we were to change that? So what if we make the disease more rare? That is, less people actually have the disease. So let's say now only 10 people are, are out of the 40 will have the disease and 30% out of the 40 will not. So again, we know that 9 out of 10 times this test, when it's positive, will be right. And for the specificity still being 90%, remember, we're using the exact same test here. So uh, we know that 90% of the time it's going to be right and 10% of the time it's going to be wrong. And so now we do the same thing with the, the sample that we have. We say, hey, everybody with a positive disease, you come up here. And everyone, I mean, a positive test, you come up here. And everyone with a negative test, you get down here. So now whenever you have a positive test, it's only correct 9 out of 12 times or 75% of the time. And whenever you have a negative test, that negative test is going to be correct 96% of the time. So 4% of the time, it will be wrong. So what happened here? We took the exact same test, the exact same sensitivity and specificity, and we took a uh, prevalence of disease which was more rare. So now we had more patients who didn't have the disease. And so with this rarer disease, the positive predictive value went down and the negative predictive value went up. And that makes sense because more people are not going to have the disease. So a negative test is more likely to be right just because most people don't have the disease. Let's look at the reverse example. So let's pick a disease which is more common. So more people have the disease. So let's say 30 of them do and 10 of them don't. So we have a higher prevalence of disease because it's more people have the disease. Now again, we know that 90% uh, of the people who have the disease will have a positive test. So we can fill in this table like this. And we know that 90% of the people who don't have the disease will have a negative test. And we do the same thing again. We tell everybody with a positive test, you come up here to the top. And everyone with a negative test, you go down here to the bottom.
So how many patients who have a positive test will actually have the disease? Well, 27 patients here. Um, of the 28 who are positive, 27 of them have the disease, so 96%. And what about down here? What's the negative predictive value? Well, of the patients who uh, were negative for the test, we know that there were 12 of them there. How many of them were actually correctly identified? Well, we know that we messed up on three of them. And so it's going to be 9 over 12, or 75% of the time. So the negative predictive value here is 75%. So similar to the last case, but now we've flipped it around. In more common diseases, the positive predictive value is going to go up, and the negative predictive value is going to go down. And again, this makes sense. More people have the disease, so you're more likely to have the disease just because more people have it. And so a positive test is more likely going to be right. And since less people don't have the disease, uh, a negative test is more likely going to be wrong because very few people are disease-free. So the negative predictive value goes down. So this has actually a very important implication uh, because let's say that you looked at a paper where the study population had a prevalence like this, where 30, 30 patients had the disease and 10 didn't. But your population actually has a different prevalence. Let's say it's a 50-50 uh, mix. So 50% of them have the disease and 50% of them don't. So is the positive test in your uh, that you got from this test, is it going to have the same value here? No, it's not. Because remember, it's very prevalence dependent. And so the prevalence of disease in this population does not match the prevalence in your population. So this sample population prevalence does not match your population. The positive predictive values are going to be different. You really shouldn't use them because the prevalence doesn't match and so the predictive values are likely going to be different. So what do you do then instead? Well, we can use something different called likelihood ratios, which we'll talk about in another video. This one, I just wanted you to know how to calculate positive predictive value and negative predictive value and to know the limitation, meaning that it is very dependent on the prevalence of the disease in the population. And if your prevalence doesn't match the prevalence in the study, well then use these numbers with caution. We'll talk about likelihood ratios later. All right, talk to you later. Bye.